Hello everyone. To, um, we are slowly moving towards assignment two, which is asking us to uh, create, a, a which is asking us to propose a um, innovative model of uh, teaching e uh, English as a second language. Now, um, bear in mind, we are still more or less in the middle of our semester, so uh, I do not expect these models um, proposed in your PowerPoints to be uh, the final proposal. So the assessment will take these uh, things in consideration. However, um, your proposals need to take into consideration the things we're discussing today. And what we will be to doing today is looking now towards future, but still through the lens of the past, past and still trying to wrap up everything we have learned in regard to um, the history of the field of TESOL, or at least the things we have covered, and learn from the past. Now, what I intend to do today is to look at these three things. Uh, I want to actually ident um, first focus on what I call the key indicators of progress. Now, I will show you that we need to be aware that um, we need progress and that there are particular indicators because, as I will illustrate in this presentation, and if we're not aware of what these um, key indicators are, things do go wrong. So next after this, so I'll show you examples of when things went wrong, when there was misalignment between the um, modern understandings of what um, language education is about and uh, the kinds of uh, models of teachings that were proposed. We will also look now uh, uh, to the future and we will look at the future from the perspective of what all this all, all this means to us as teachers and future researchers. Now, there are different ways in which we can talk about language learning, but we are in educational environment and we have no choices. So language education is about education. So what we need to do is to actually ask ourselves what education is all about. And I've got this handy metaphor that I use, um, and I might share it with you. I've already have shared it before, but just to uh, make a bigger point out of it. As you may recall, I dif differentiate between socialization and education. For me, socialization is about um, a social training. It's about training the eye, training our perception systems to discern between that which is relevant and that which is not relevant or not considered relevant in our immediate context, in the context of our participation in a social life. So you are born able to learn any language on the planet. You end up knowing one, two, three maximum. Very few people learn in a native way. Um, more than that. So socialization is about reducing our options so that we can be very good in what our immediate society actually requires from us or values. Now education is about expanding our horizons. It's about expanding our immediate history. It's about us have seeing more as opposed to seeing only what's required in more immediate context of our social participation. So just to summarize, I talk about um, education in terms of what, why and how. This is just my shortcut. I can work with these what, why and how components in more than one way. But here, what I would like to actually stress is that we need to expand students' perceptions rega regarding the kinds of range of things that people do. Not in every culture people do same things. I have here written engage elderly because um, not in every culture actually 
uh, young people engage older people, especially all the people they don't know. There is this veil or this um, wall of uh, respect between uh, younger people and older people. And as my um, uh, former PhD student Maliwan Bunarapatana from Konkan University would testify, she had to teach her Thai college students, Thai university students, to act, to, uh, that it was actually quite fine to go to older people, introduce themselves and actually engage those people in conversations that were relevant to their research projects. So that in different cultures, across cultures, people do different things. They do different things because they have different values. They value different things. So expansion in those values, it doesn't mean that one has to like the poetry of Poland or, or the, the paintings of France. That doesn't mean that what it, but you need to have frames of reference uh, or uh, access to frames of reference so that you can actually appreciate the, 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 the terms in relation to which these people construct their um, actions and why they value them. And what you do is one thing, but at least as, uh, it's relevant that you as a student, when you learn another language, that you actually have um, integrated or engaged in um, those terms and uh, you can work with them now or uh, use them in an informed way. So we've covered what and why and people do things differently depending obviously on which values they will be, um, on, uh, depending on the values uh, which will inform those things. So even the same action in a different context is different is done differently. So that's very important. So basically here, these, this concern with language as education, language as, um, as, as, as um, not as an object of learning, but as a, a focus of education and an, another tool for uh, exposing children to education as a, as a, as a form of uh, supporting students general expansion is very important because here what we're seeing is language is no longer just words organized by grammar, but it is about engaging students entire personal histories in the context of language learning. They are not just to produce expected responses from the teachers or responses that are expected by their teachers. What students now need to do is two things expose them themselves to the diversity of actions, beliefs, and the means with which people uh, achieve these actions so that when, in, when acting uh, or interacting with target language communities, they have a broader choice. So this enables support students in making informed judgment about what happens and not to necessarily always react with um, resentment to differences simply because they do not know how to read them. So language is not an, an object of learning. What is here being learned is uh, the ways in which students approach people and the things that people do. So language is seen here as a cultural artifact and people are seen as participants in that culture and its subsequent um, builders. Each action is not a reproduction of culture, but it's actually its recreation. So each action in a sense also changes this culture ever so slightly. So what I will suggest in this presentation that this idea of um, language learning as uh, students' participation in a process of education which deal, which is focused on students' expansion would be a 
indicator of progress, right? And it's not necessarily an indicator that I personally believe in, which I do, but I believe in it not only because this is my choice, but also because it is based on research and it is also that this view is reflected through Australian curricula. We want our students to be participants if, uh, in cultures. We don't want them to be simply robots. So now we will be, when we actually assess um, what we think about the um, earlier methods in TESOL and how we should move forward, we will be looking through the lens of this uh, progress indicator, which uh, we could um, term as meaning for expansion. Now, there could be many different ways in which I could actually talk about um, uh, education as a tool of expansion and how this relates to hi the history of TESOL, but I will look at assessment, simply because assessment is seen by modern cur curriculum designers as central, as being at the heart of um, any um, design of any learning activity. So if we are interested in creating a unit of work, it will be assessment around which we will build the entire unit of work. Uh, in Australian culture, typically a unit of work uh, comprises of five uh, weeks of work and is uh, centered around two assessment pieces. That's in schools, one smaller one and larger one at, at the end. If assessment is right at the heart of the unit of work, it only makes sense that teaching should be oriented towards supporting students in completing the assessment projects. And this is very important because when students are aware of what the assessment project is, now they can engage in class activities by relating what is done in class to the assessment project, right? So now both teachers and students have a common objective, which is for students to complete the assignment uh, in the best way possible. So the teacher does that by creating activities that support students in this objective and students are uh, evaluating this support in relation to how they perceive themselves in their assessment project. So if we look now into the various uh, methods of the past, what was uh, what kind of assessment did these methods prefer? So for grammar translation method, it was to translate a text. Direct method was to argue a text, interpret a text. For audiolingual method was to create a dialogue. Uh, audiovisual method was similar to direct method. Not in every case, not in every case, but yes. Um, uh, direct method, but done with uh, technology and TPL was giving a uh, preference to uh, procedural uh, types of activities. Now, what is it that they all had in common? This is the question that I would like to ask in this presentation. Why do they belong to the past? Well, this is not quite the case. Direct method is still prevailing quite well and thriving. Um, so, but what did they have actually in common? Now, we will be looking at the commonalities between these assessment tasks from the perspective of this progress indicator, which is um, education as a tool uh, supporting students' expansion. So, when you, in, in, in the grammar translation method, when the text was treated as uh, unproblematic object with students, using dictionaries and the understanding of grammar in order to reproduce the text, but now in their native language or vice versa, 
Um, whether that worked or not, we could debate, but in the way the assessment task is positioned, it does not make specific demands on students' uh, cultural expansion. And that's the difference. The difference is that the assessment task was not looking at ways in which students showed their um, not just appreciation, but understanding and the ability to strategically work with their understanding regarding what people do, why and how. And that's very different. So in the grammar translation uh, method, we have language as an object, language as not part of a human being, as, as a thing, as a tool, whereas um, in this model that I present for you, where education is seen as expansion, language is an inter internal part, is, is the uh, internal part of a student. And what is happening now, education actually engages the entire histories of students in order to generate expansion of the terms upon which those students act. So it's a much more profound change that is requested from students nowadays than it was in the past. Direct method, the same situation happens in the direct method. Um, the, uh, the idea was that um, it is the language that people were learning. So the language as um, appropriate amount of words with uh, stage grammar um, difficulties was presented to students and then students were to formulate responses to questions or produce maybe um, relatively short independent um, texts by manipulating those words. Again, students were manipulating words, they were not manipulating culture. So um, in that sense we could conclude that direct method, whether it was testing or teaching, was not actually directly focusing on creating uh, profound changes in, the way, in, in students' histories, in the way students were and perceive things and organize things and act it. So still language was a tool, was not a, an integral, um, um, aspect or part of a human being. Audiolingual method again was kind of languages again um, external to a person. Students are reproducing texts as if texts were again not cultural artifacts and the choices were um, not so much dependent on person's uh, intentions and uh, the uh, choice, the kind of cultural choices they make, it was um, believed that language is more neutral and therefore uh, those uh, pre-prepared dialogues will prepare students for activating appropriate exchanges in situations where meaning was more or less seen as exchange of words rather than, um, <laughs> there I quote Bourdieu, going to um, in, uh, engaging in a situation in order to win. By win, I don't mean obviously to win in a sense, in a negative sense, but actually for maximum impact. Audiovisual me uh, method is, uh, I just mentioned it here because uh, some of our students are not aware of it, very typical uh, for French and German. Done differently, I would be scared to say that there was a shared um, basis each time, but very more often than not, audiovisual method was just direct method done with technology, which meant using um, video recorders, uh, television, and la later on laser discs. And then we have TPR, which is about uh, procedural um, procedures, procedural language. Again, 
um, the idea was that students can um, reproduce required sentences at the required time. Again, um, the idea that reproducing language or giving to teachers what they expect does not guarantee that any form of understanding on the part of student actually happened uh, was typical of that. Um, so that idea um, was absent and um, it is exactly the point where the change towards um, modern pedagogies actually happened. So now what uh, education is concerned is not with students, what's called playing a pedagogic game, which means producing what's required. What uh, education, at least in principle, is concerned about is with students being able to be critical and creative participants in the culture and seeing themselves as an object and 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 uh, producers of culture so both so we can see that to summarize those uh, different forms of assessment what they were actually uh, having in co what they had in common was an assumption that there is a separation between a human being and how they actually engage in language exchanges. So language was kind of more neutral and people could learn words in order to respond to particular requests, but language as a, a cultural artifact, as a tool for students' um, understanding of themselves in uh, in relation to the bigger picture of uh, human society was absent. And we will actually follow these concerns right through this presentation. So what happened? Um, these past methods were identified by uh, Widowson as advocating internalization of units of meaning, be it phrases, vocabulary, um, grammar, so that they are put in store, so to speak, ready for use when required, okay? So the assumption was you just put this stuff in the student's head and students will reproduce it on demand. Again, this only emphasizes the point that I was making. Students were reproducing those neutral pieces of um, uh, language. What they were not actually doing is engaging in a form of learning which, had a, which would have had a profound effect on their own histories, on their own ways in which they approach people and do things and respond to how people do things. So what were the alternatives, right? What alternatives do I have in mind to suggest to you as possibly informing your uh, proposals for innovative models of teaching? So we're still talking theory because you need some theory. So I will take you now to my fa one of my favorite authors, that's Anne Friedman, from, currently from the University of Melbourne and previously at the University of Queensland. And now, just to actually for us reflect on the concept of communication or interaction before, as you saw in the previous um, methods, um, language was neutral, was just basically the ab valued was the ability of students uh, simply working with these uh, neutral uh, phrases and reproducing them and the concern about students understanding of what they were actually saying and how they uh, were coming across to other people and how to be actually and how to participate critically in a, another culture we're not we're not the objectives it's just that was absent but here look what look what Anne Friedman is saying thinking of interaction as being about giving and receiving meanings. It's like describing a game of tennis as the giving and receiving of balls, right? 
Well, I will not tell you that that's how I play tennis, but I think it's too relevant to this lecture. <laughs> right, but we wouldn't think of game of tennis as giving and receiving of uh, balls because then people wouldn't be paying those tennis players a million of millions of dollars, right? Whoever plays tennis with me finds it really boring and people usually bail, bail out from playing with me. So what she's saying, she's saying, she's suggesting here an alternative. She's saying that each of these shots has a strategic value. It has a value. You play to win. You play to win. And she doesn't mean by that that you play to win in order to destroy a person. You play for maximum impact, for least ambiguity, for maximum precision, for your, inter for your shot to actually count the way you intend it. Now, that's very interesting, isn't it? How are you going to do that if all you do is produce a, um, you just study a limited amount of words and you with each week you expand those words and then you respond to questions and then um, you might even summarize a text. How's that gonna help you to actually play to win? Not much. So what happens now, rather than thinking of education as of language education as we have to hurry through the syllables and we have to give them by lesson three, they've got to know 30 words by lesson 40, they need to know 300 words. I'll tell you one thing, they won't. But if you do it in a different way, they probably will exceed your expectations. Because brain is a magnificent thing. It When actually we work with the brain, we actually achieve things faster and better. So um, this this statement you can actually find backed up but in some other of my lectures that I produce for undergraduate students and you can find them on YouTube and you have links to them. So I will not spend time on this point. But here, communication as playing to win. Interesting, interesting. So now, what I am saying here in blue, supporting students in these kind of decisions, which is how to play, to, I, I, I just want to generalize it, how to play to win, will need to take place before we are confident that we are truly engaging, not denying students social heritage. Now, why would I say that here? Supporting students in these kinds of decisions will need to take place before we are confident that we are truly engaging, not denying students' cultural and social heritage. What I'm saying here is that if we treat language as an object, as, a, as, a, as, as those neutral um, forms of expression that students will reproduce on demand and in, in relation to their uh, teachery tasks we we'll give them, what is happening really here is not only that we have no way of saying that students actually understood what they are saying, which means that they actually develop deep and profound understanding of the meaning of those um, expressions in ways that allow them to discern between when to use it, how to use it, and in what context and in what context not, and what to change in those phrases in order to uh, have uh, in order to uh, res respond to complexities of the context. Now, what happens when we treat language as neutral? What happens? We don't see it as in any shape uh, engaging students' cultural and social heritage. We are denying the obvious, which is that how we use language is related to our uh, uh, histories, to our own, to the ways in which we um, have come to understand what things are, how they are, and why they are the way they are. So now, 
this is a bit problematic because in Australian schools, we really, really want to be inclusive and we really, really want to include, uh, make, um, make considerations for students' cultural and social heritage. And we often do that by saying, okay, now you can say this how it's said in English, or now you can say it how it's said in Polish, now you can say it how it's said in French or something or Chinese. Now that's not good enough. What I'm stressing here, that what we need to do is to engage students' histories, engage students' heritage. And the only way we can do it is by creating supportive enough activities for students to relate those aspects of what, why and how to how they see these aspects from their perspective. So in order to actually generate profound change or profound expansion or profound deep understanding in students' minds, what we need to do is to actually provide students with a very rich contextual support contextual support and contextual support will be what is supportive to them not what I think is supportive but what actually is supportive from their perspective that's why one of the aspects of moving forward is not necessarily just changing activities and maybe um, providing some contextual support What's really required is to provide students with adequate, rich support so that the way in which they engage in an interaction in a foreign language is not about reproducing what the teacher wants to hear, but, a, but an interaction of the sorts reflects students' profound engagement in those cultural aspects of interactions so that students are not acting like puppets, but they are acting out as per critical participants. Right? So the key here will be to provide students with rich contextual support. Now, this concept is um, much better and deeper explored in other videos of which, to which you have links. But you can see now how important it is uh, in an environment that wants to be inclusive, wants to make uh, allowances and place for differences, how important it is now to think of students as requiring a complex, complex support not just artificial or if not artificial then superficial support in the form now you can say it how you say bread roll in polish or um how do you what do you eat in china for breakfast right these are just uh ad hoc ideas what we need is to think about language support in a principled way, in a profound way, and only once we can actually produce conditions that are rich in support, then we can say we have truly engaged or made, um, we have truly engaged students' cultural and uh, social heritage. What we did not do is deny it. We said people are different. They come to our language classes with their own individual histories. And now we want them to expand those histories. The only way I can do it is by providing contextual support whereby language is seen as a tool for expanding those histories, not for replacing them with English ones. Because the latter is impossible. You cannot replace. Something else actually happens. But one thing for sure, if you actually deny students 
uh, culture and social heritage, you're not really teaching them to speak a language. What you teach them is to play your game and that game will last for as long as your classes last and then very little is left. So no true learning, no deep learning is actually happening. So alternatives. Now we're back into Widowson. It's very important that we actually look into Widowson because Widowson has been seen as a pivotal uh, person in actually making change in language teaching. And I have to say that I have enjoyed Widowson's writing, except that, so it's 1990 book, Aspects of Communication and communi Communicative Language Teaching. I can't remember anymore the title perfectly well, but you do, you have it in your references. So what happens was that the critique that Widowson produced of, uh, of the methods of the past was brilliant. He talked about exactly that linear way of teaching language from, from less complex to, from less to more, from, from less words being learned or taught to more words being taught this kind of, and, and emphasis was on internalizing as opposed to on um, strategically manipulating now remember if you want to if you want to emphasize strategic which is cultural culturally informed manipulation of language tools if you want to emphasize this, you actually have to give students access to um, to a wide range of factors that participate in that interaction. You can't actually wipe out things because you have wiped out everything that partakes in that interaction. At the end of the day, a stick figure is not me. It's just a drawing, right? So children don't tend not to draw full human beings. They tend to draw, human children tend to draw uh, stick figures. Right, but that's not me. <laughs> so the same comes with language teaching. If you want students to have an understanding of participation in a language that is culturally informed and that students can use language in ways in order to win, which means in ways which are strategic, strategic in order to win, right? You have to give students access to the context which means, in other words, I, I don't use the word context, but I'll just put it here just for the ease. But what I mean here, by, by what I mean by this is to all the po possible components that from the perspective of students help them understand increasingly better what goes on in that interaction. If you as a teacher wipe out students access to these kinds of understandings you tell me what happens i will tell you what happens because research has been done on it herman and these other people produced research you can actually work it out for yourself what will happen or for yourselves but they've done research and documented it so you can read in this slide but what actually will happen if you do not give students access to this context, which means to the elements that partake in the inter uh, to the elements that take that are present in that particular interaction, but actually wipe out some because you believe that students can't cope with it. What you have done, you have changed those conditions, and therefore you have actually created. Um, you have actually created a different, different construct. It's no longer the language as it is. And sorry for this um, intellectual shortcut. I just have to use them here. So you have actually changed the language by changing what you give students access to by wiping out things because you worry about the difficulty. You actually are changing the construct, changing the, all the elements. So students are no longer learning 
the way in which language is used, why and how and what, what they are learning is your guesses, your thoughts, the construct that you have in your head and that informs your way of um, organizing uh, text for students learning. And this is exactly why I have a problem with Widowson and the way he actually, he suggests the way of uh, teaching language for communicative purposes. He uses words like contri con contr con contrivance, which means artificiality, right? Uh, Students cannot actually cope, he says, with natural conditions of language use. But what does that mean? Students can't cope with natural conditions of language use. Obviously, they can't. But that doesn't me mean that doesn't mean that we have to change those conditions, because by changing those conditions, we change the construct. You see, what happened was that. Widowson, my guess is, and my knowledge is, was a linguist, was an applied linguist, and through the lens of linguistics, he was still seeing, doesn't matter how hard he worked at it, he was still seeing language as words and grammar and some other um, ahistorical components. Right, so ahistorical, what it means was was the things we can talk about, like words and grammar, and we and we can actually learn them and present them to students as, as, as objects. And yet they are not objects, because later on I'll show you a quote by Bourdieu, which said, I'm just, um, I shouldn't be scrolling now, later on, which says that language doesn't exist as an object. People, when they study things, they objectify them, they turn them into objects, but they are not objects. So we can talk about things and we can call this words and we can call that grammar, but these things are neither words nor grammar. How things are organized, who knows? So knowledge for scientific purposes is um, like anything else, developed for a purpose not in order to tell the truth, but develop for a purpose. So that purpose might serve us, but it doesn't mean that we actually have uncovered the truth about how things are. So that's because the truth changes very quickly, actually, nowadays. So just to come back to this point, if we are to summarize, and this is very, very important here. That's why I'm spending such long time here. If we are to facilitate students, oh, look what happened. If we, exactly what I wanted to show you, this quote, <laughs> we got there. I will show it to you later. Um, if we want to facilitate students' strategic uh, uh, ways if we want to facilitate students' use of language in a, in, a, in a way that is strategic in order for them to actually go to win, so they have to be culturally informed in order to actually know how to do that, we need to give them access to rich contextual support so that they can actually explore. Explore is the key word. They can explore what actually is... Uh, explore what is actually participating in the event. The kinds of elements that they need to consider. Now, obviously, they will be exploring this from their own perspective. So now the goal of the teacher the goal of the teacher is to facilitate rich contextual support so that these perspectives can, in, can engage in a, in a specific target language interaction in a way that they undergo change or expansion, right? Change or expansion. And my point is, if you do not give students access to the language as it is, to the interactions as they are, to their 
uh, contextual support that will enable students to increasingly better understand what actually goes on in an interaction, you do not support a student. You actually do the opposite. You change the object of their learning and it is no longer the language as it is spoken. It is the language as you, the designer of the curriculum, understand it to be. They are not learning English, they are learning your English. And what research tells us, that brain is a very interesting thing. You cannot fool the brain. What actually happens is if you wipe out or change those conditions, some things will be missing. You prevent students from exploring how it is, therefore you make some things missing. But the brain is very smart, it knows something should be there, so it will take elements from the first language and shove them right there in the second language. And we, as researchers, will call it fossilization. Right? I am not saying that fossilization is not a real and a real um, phenomenon, but what I was saying that we as language teachers play a very, very pivotal role in, stu in supporting students' fossilization. When we remove students, when we, when we change the object of students' learning and it is no longer the language as it is, then what happens, the gaps that we have created as a result will be replaced by the student with the information from the first language. And that's what makes the entire teaching look so smooth. Oh, look, students have learned. Oh, look, students have done this. Students have not done anything. They haven't understood. They haven't learned what they did. They dealt with the problem, but not the problem as it would be had they been actually trying to explore the language as it is. They dealt with the problem that you presented to them and where they uh, had missing bits they brought their first language, they produced something, all, you know, filled the puzzle, the pieces of the puzzle and produced something to which the teacher nodded, the teacher accepted, and the truth is it was just a game. There was no profound change or profound understanding that actually occurred in students' minds. And that's the problem, and that's the kind of research that I'm quoting here. Here, these researchers were working with intonation and grammar, but we don't, and they actually identified this, this phenomenon, where when you remove elements in language, those elements will actually occur in students' output, but they will be painted with students' first language or first culture. So what's the solution here? What's the solution? The solution is very simple. I have actually said that already. The solution is not what's a, uh, what most um, um, applied linguists suggest, which is to, br to introduce control and artificiality. I mean, um, Widowson is not alone here. What we need to do is to do that, give students access to the natural conditions of language use, give students access. And I call this objective of giving students access to those conditions as providing students with rich contextual support. So where our teaching is to focus, where our research is to focus, 
is on the kinds of tools and activities that will create which, which, which students can use as inroads into those lang conditions of language use, paths, doors, anything that enables them to traverse through the complexity of the elements and make increasingly better sense out of what goes on. So that I am not saying that in the beginning students will not be inserting their first language there. They will. But with rich support, sooner or later they will find another clue and another clue and another clue that the support that you provide will make a make it obvious to them that there is more happening than they assumed. So the entire learning that I suggest is about creating activities and providing students with rich contextual support so that students actually make informed decisions as they engage in target language interactions and these informed decisions are based on them comparing and contrasting different aspects of language use and evaluating which and how which ones and how to use to win for the best or for the maximum impact right so it, 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 is, it, it will be a long road, it will take time, but here we are not teaching them a language of our own <coughs> imagination. What we're actually doing is providing support for them to have uh, increasingly better tools or creating their minds increasingly efficient tools for dealing with language as it is for dealing with the natural conditions of language use right it is a much more efficient way and at least if we in language teaching and that's a word that we use in TESOL often with the word authentic right the, this is authentic because this is this is actually accounting for language as authentic and by authentic here means not changed by the teacher right so up to the time where Widowson is um, criticizing uh, all the methods, I am with him on the same page. When he starts proposing alternatives, where in fact education is not in his alternatives about supporting students' expansion through tools and activities that provides students with rich contextual support to learn, to explore. But instead, what he's suggesting, to introduce artificiality, contrivance, to change the language, he and I part right there. Because as soon as you create a change in the conditions in which language is used, you have changed the language and you're no longer teaching students to be in English you're teaching them to be in your classroom these are two different things I'll stop here and I will create part two and part three of this lecture and in this way we will have separate videos so it's gonna be easier on your computer and also on YouTube so this is the end of part one and now we will look more into part two where I will produce examples demonstrating to you uh, when what happens when we actually do what Widowson suggests which means we change the language and instead of teaching students to be in English we teach them to be in the classroom and to learn not to work with English, but to work with structures 
as the teacher presents them. I'll show you what happens in part two. And in part three, we will look into uh, future in terms of research and teaching.